So there's a quote by Friedrich Nietzsche that I really like. He who fights with monsters should look into it that he himself does not become a monster. When you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. Now, to kind of go from a philosophical standpoint, whenever you break the way something works in order to make it work a different way, it's not going to work in the original intended way. And that's something we're seeing because of an old internet backdoor law. Chinese hackers have exploited it and are now taking advantage of what was to help law enforcement pretty much do whatever they want and wreak havoc on the system. Today we are facing an unprecedented array of data breaches, hacking attempts, and surges in digital crime. Why is there such a widespread amount and how little is noticed in our everyday lives? Malware, dark sites, brute forcing, zero days, script kitties, and nation state hackers are all on the rise. Learn more about the threats we face and gain a bit more knowledge than yesterday. Hey everyone, another episode of Exploit Brokers is coming to you now. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Exploit Brokers. This is Laudo, your host. If you're on YouTube, please do me a favor, hit that like, subscribe, and bell notification icon so you get notifications. If you're somewhere on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please do me a favor, review the podcast, leave a review, and follow us. Uh, it helps us grow the channel, and if you could do me that favor, it'd be great so we can get this to as many people as possible. With that said, let's jump into it. So, in an article by TechCrunch titled, The 30-Year-Old Internet Backdoor Law That Came Back to Bite, we're going to go ahead and talk about it, what's going on. We have Chinese-backed hackers that are hacking into the telecom systems because of stuff that pretty much was mandated to be there. News broke this weekend that China-backed hackers have compromised the wiretap systems of several U.S. telecom and internet providers, likely in an effort to gather intelligence on Americans. The wiretap systems, as mandated under a 30-year-old U.S. federal law, are some of the most sensitive in a telecom or internet provider's network, typically granting a select few employees nearly unfettered access to information about their customers, including their internet traffic and browsing histories. But for the technologists, who have for years sounded the alarm about security risks of legally required backdoors, news of the compromises are the told-you-so moment they hoped would never come but knew one day would. So what is a backdoor? A backdoor is pretty much anything in a system that allows you to get, that allows you to get access in a way that wouldn't necessarily be conventional, right? So when you backdoor a software, when you backdoor a system, you're making it so you can get back into it or get into it in a way that wouldn't necessarily be expected. When you backdoor encryption, that means, you know, party A and party B exchange information, keys and all that, and they're able to encrypt and decrypt stuff between themselves. A backdoor in the encryption means that there's someone with a skeleton key that can also grab that message and unlock it, even though it's not part of the original A and B system. That's an oversimplification, but just to kind of give you an idea of what I mean by a backdoor here. And there's backdoors that seem to have been built into telecom systems because of a US government law. We continue. I think it absolutely was inevitable. Matt Blaze, a professor at Georgetown Law and expert on secure systems, told TechCrunch regarding the latest compromises of telecom and internet providers. The Wall Street Journal first reported Friday that a Chinese government hacking group dubbed Salt Typhoon, so that's an APT or an Advanced Persistent Threat Actor, nicknamed Salt Typhoon, broke into three of the largest US internet service providers, including AT&T, Lumen, formerly CenturyLink, and Verizon, to access systems they use for facilitating customers' data to law enforcement and governments. The hacks reportedly may have resulted in the vast collection of internet traffic from telecom and internet giants. CNN and the Washington Post also confirmed the intrusions and that the US government's investigation is, is, is in its early stages. What we're seeing, right, you had three major providers. These are pretty much some of the biggest providers, uh, AT&T, Lumen, and Verizon. I'm pretty sure everyone's familiar with AT&T and Verizon, and most people may have that in their town. Some people may have Comcast or uh, Spectrum or different things like that. I don't know if Com... I believe Comcast does internet, but I'm not necessarily privy to that. And what we're seeing is, right, with those three broken into, that is a substantial amount of people in the U.S. The goals of the Chinese campaign are not yet fully known, but the WSJ, or the Wall Street Journal, cited national security sources who consider the breach potentially catastrophic. I would say it's actually very catastrophic, not just potentially. Salt Typhoon, the hackers in question, 
is one of the several related Chinese-backed hacking units thought to be laying the groundwork for destructive cyber attacks in the event of an anticipated future conflict between China and the United States potentially over Taiwan. So you have a subset of hackers, or at least a category of hackers, known as threat actors, which is where the APT or Advanced Persistent Threat Actor, essentially anytime you have hackers that are being given money, funding, and support from a government agency or from a government, and they're doing hacking against other nations and stuff like that, that's where it usually falls into the nation state hackers because they're backed by the nation. And that's where a lot of the cyber war comes from. It's not necessarily the cyber criminals that are doing cyber war, although you could kind of argue that some of the mayhem they cause is in a similar realm, but their motives are different, right? They're trying to get money versus if it's a nation state hacker, they're trying to advance the agenda of the nation that's backing them. So Blaze told TechCrunch that the Chinese intrusions into US wiretap systems are the latest example of a malicious abuse of a backdoor ostensibly meant for lawful and legal purposes. The security community has long advocated against backdoors, arguing that it's technologically impossible to have a secure backdoor that cannot also be exploited or abused by malicious actors. I agree. You cannot have a vulnerable system that is only vulnerable for one person. Because eventually, someone's going to figure out how to become and mimic the person who can access it, right? Whether that's getting in behind a firewall, getting behind, using a VPN to access the vulnerable part of a system, whether that's figuring out credentials. There's a million ways to access backdoors. If they exist, you can pretty much assume that at some point they're going to be accessed, which is why I'm generally a proponent against backdooring stuff. It's, it's never going to come out as good as you think it will. You always have to kind of go what is the worst case scenario that can happen because that's probably going to happen. Murphy's Law. Again, that's probably butchering what Murphy's Law is, but kind of where I'm coming from. The law says your telecom must make your calls wiretappable unless it encrypts them, creating a system that was always a target for bad actors, said Rihanna Pefferkon. I'm butchering that. A Stanford academic and encryption policy expert in a thread on Blue Sky. The hack exposes that the lie that the US government needs to be able to read every message you send and listen to every call you make for your own protection. The system is jeopardizing you, not protecting you. The only solution is more encryption. I agree. Whenever you have systems that can be used for good, there's probably going to be a way to use it for evil. And that line is very close, right? I am I'm major for good guys catching the bad guys. But when good guys catching the bad guys goes into the realm of making it so that everything can be read and seen and you know the privacy gets kind of pulled back a bit there there's a very fine line to draw i'm not going to get into the politics or the legality of it but safe to say from a security standpoint whenever you make a system less secure for party a party b is going to eventually be able to get into it and now it's not secure at all um and when you talk to stuff like when you talk about stuff like uh, mobile or phone, right? Text messages, SMS is already not encrypted, right? That stuff gets sent over the wire more or less in plain text. It gets stored in a database somewhere to be able to get sent to the recipient, probably in plain text. And stuff like that is just kind of sent across the wire with no security, right? And that's where, you know, certain providers and apps and stuff are trying to do like end-to-end -end encryption because if you sniff a garbled packet well it's a garbled packet unless you backdoor that encryption as well but then now there's two things you got to get through right you got to know the backdoor for the encryption and be able to sniff this packet that goes over the wire and that's just for all wiretapping right if you were to open up wireshark you could sniff the the traffic in your network at home uh you can only ever use wireshark or you should only ever use wireshark in a legal sense because you could get in trouble if you were to abuse it right only and this goes for anything, only ever hack on systems you have permission to or that you own. Anything else could get you into legal trouble. I am not a lawyer. I am not facilitating legal advice. But general of thumb, don't hack something you shouldn't, right? Now, the 30-year-old law that set the stage for recent backdoor abuse is the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, or CALA which became law in 1994 at a time when cell phones were a rarity and the internet was still in its infancy. 
yeah, it definitely was in its infancy, right? Back then, 1994, you're talking dial-up and uh, BOD modems, probably. Um, I don't remember the exact timeline. But suffice it to say, iPhones and all that were in the rage in 1994. Wiretapping, be wiretapping became big business in the post-2000 era following the September 11 attacks in 2001. The subsequent introduction of post-9-11 laws, such as the Patriot Act, vastly expanded U.S. surveillance and intelligence gathering, including on Americans. Kayla and other surveillance law around this time gave rise to an entire industry of third-party wiretapping companies that helped phone and internet companies comply with the laws by wiretapping on their behalf. And that's where kind of everything ends up falling to. Whenever there's something that needs to get done, there's always going to be a third party or a private company to do it. Now, the article keeps going on, uh, right? Because in the early 2000s, people weren't aware that this was happening even into the late 2000s. It wasn't until the 2010s with the Snowden leaks that a lot of the American people and the world became, you know, privy to some of the stuff that was happening in the wiretapping and all that that was going on. Um, I'm not going to touch that on this article because that goes into an entirely different conversation in itself. Now, later on in the article, the article actually touches on Signal. I'll read that article and then I'll kind of give my, my uh, feedback on that. So Signal, the end-to-end -end encrypted messaging app, has been one of the most vocal critics of encryption backdoors and cited the recent breach at US internet providers by the Chinese as a reason why the European proposals pose a serious cybersecurity threat. Yes, I totally agree. I believe I had read a while back that when Signal was probed for information by some law enforcement agency, the only information that they actually have or keep on their system is the date an account was formed. Um, that could have changed since I read that article. I don't know about the latest, but that's what I had read. So when the government agency requested the information, all they could give them was that information. And that was a major plus on Signal. Because the less information a company has, and the more information is in control by a user, the better is going to be for the privacy of a user, right? You're never going to rat yourself out. And in the US, you know, the Fifth Amendment technically should prevent you from uh, incriminalizing yourself which is where I think some of the privacy stuff should kind of go. The more stuff is kept out of servers and out of permanent storage, the better. Because ultimately, anything that is in plain text will eventually be able to get read, and anything encrypted, you have to assume, could be backdoored or broken or, you know, even like MD5. MD5 has been broken for years, but there was a time where people thought MD5 was decent, right? The computing power wasn't enough, and now you can go on websites put in an md5 hash and nine times out of ten it's going to have the unhashed value and as we get further and further and stuff like ai and like 4090s and cloud computing become more prevalent and cheaper eventually even encryption you're going to be able to brute force to an extent um you have stuff like you know 128 bit 256 bit 512 bit and you know salting and other stuff you can do to make it more secure but there will probably come a day where that's also going to be uh not as useful they're already talking about quantum encryption because once we have uh quantum computing that should be able to, that should be able to break a lot of the encryption stuff we have faster that's a conversation for another day because that's just a whole different mindset to even talk about to kind of circle back though we have in the u.s laws on the books that make it so that internet providers and telecoms have to backdoor their stuff and because of those back doors, they're creating a vulnerability. So if a threat actor or a cyber criminal organization or just any malicious actor can gain access to it, they pretty much have admin or root. They are super user on the system because these backdoor systems are not just simple stuff built in. They essentially have the view of the entire system. It is the king of the castle, if you will. So gaining access to these systems is the treasure trove for anyone wanting information on telecom or people's connections and stuff like that. And we're not going to see these attacks go away. We're going to see these kinds of attacks ramp up more and more, especially as the quiet cyber war escalates. Because getting, being able to get into infrastructure, being able to get information, intel, uh, figure out more intelligence on the citizens on infrastructure and all that stuff 
you can lay out a really good cyber plan if you wanted to wreak havoc. And that's what I think is going on. You have a lot of these threat actors, the nation state backed ones, are doing hardcore recon. They're cranking the recon up to 11 and getting as much as they can and in injecting themselves anywhere and everywhere that they can and where would be critical. Because I'm pretty sure there's a quote that says, strike when your opponent least expects it. And we're going to see that. I guarantee it. But guys, I want to thank you for tuning in. I want to thank you for staying this long. This has been Laudo with Explore Brokers. I want to thank you and I will see you in the next one.